blood, sweat, drops of blood for mine. How marvelous, oh how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, oh how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. In pity, angels beheld him and came from the world of light. And my sorrows, he made them his very own. Thank you, Lord. Fill with a burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. How marvelous, oh, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, oh, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. When with the ransom in glory is raised, I at last shall sing. Will be my joy to the ages to sing of His love for me. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous. Let's end on the first. Is my Savior's love for me on the first? I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, oh, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. Oh, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. you got to get that this morning. you got to get Jesus Christ's love for you. Turn to page 492. And I was talking to Danny a couple, Danny Colon a couple, like a week or so ago, about just the amazement of God's long-suffering to us. And uh, I was just describing this atheist that I was watching just literally use... And like I went into a lot of anatomical detail because I'm a nurse and I'm a nerd. But like all the, the functions that God put together to work to even like have life-giving sound come out of your mouth, that you can hear it. Like the vibrations and like, how, like through the air and that you can understand cognitive thought from that. And that they can sit there and say, there is no God? Come on. I was just amazed at that the long-suffering of God and his love towards us and all of that. I mean... Jesus loves even me. Let's sing it. 492. I hope you, I hope you know that this morning, that the, that the righteous God of heaven loves you specifically, you personally. I hope you're glad about it. I am so glad that our Father in heaven tells of his love in the book he has given. Wonderful things in the Bible I see. This is the dearest that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Even me. Though I forget him and wander away. I am so glad that Jesus loves me, Jesus loves even me. Oh, if there's only one song I can sing, when it is beauty I see. 
the great king. This shall my song in eternity be. Oh, what a wonder that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. On the second. So glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Though I forget him and wander away, still he does love me wherever I stay. Back to his dear loving arms would I flee when I remember that Jesus loves me. I am so glad Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad. Let's finish on the first. On the first. Jesus loves me me. I am so glad that our Father in heaven tells of his love in the book he has given. Wonderful things in the Bible I see. This is the dearest that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Thank you for singing. You may be seated. Thank you, dear pastor. Sorry, now it works. They probably didn't hear me before. So, uh, hello again. I'm not going to go through everything again. But uh, they're not really visitors, but hello to the woods. Where the woods go? There they are, the whole crew, right? Hello, woods, all right? You're not, you're not visitors, so, I mean, I can't, you know, I can't get, you know. Anyway, uh, and now Mike, Mike and Nayeli have some, the family with them. You guys have been here before. It's great to see you guys again. Thank you for being with us here today. Um, Brianna, you're not a visitor anymore. You hit four. That's it. You know, the, 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 the thrill is gone. No, I'm kidding. No, it's great to see you again. Christina, great to see you again also. Um, not really visitors again, but I'm glad you're back. Glad you came back. Um, Stephen and Jenny, you have some family with you, right? You want to introduce them? Because I forgot all their names already. Thank you for being with us here, guys. Thank you so much for being here. Amen, amen. And uh, George, just wave your hand back there. George, he kind of... He was a faithful trooper last week. I didn't probably announce it properly. He came to the building. We weren't here last week. He uh, very studious. He found out we were at Homedale. He showed up at Homedale. But I'm glad he was able to make it here. We, we met George way back when, it was, when this was just a, a folding table at the Keyport Promenade. You know, going back years ago when Eli and I just went fishing and we just used to set up a table and hand out tracks two or three times a week. So it's nice to have him there. And... Uh, She's definitely not a visitor, but where is our Hawaiian? Where is, is she here? There's Jessica Hakim is here. Jessica's in. I know, so it's great to see you, Jessica. Awesome. Amen, amen, amen. Um, anybody here? Anybody here else for the first time? I'm not going to say anybody else here for the last time. That's a bad joke, but uh, <laughs> you so graciously laugh at that horrible joke. You'd only laugh at a joke like that in church because it's terrible. But um, thank you for being here. A couple of quick things coming up. Uh, we have a chance, if you read the text, we have a chance to get into the rescue mission again this upcoming Friday. Um, a very limited basis. It's only going to be three of us going. And uh, the brother George over there said he'll take it week by week, or month by month, I should say. So for right now, it's just going to be maybe two or three of us going. 
and there are no what they call transients. It's not the guys that they usually take in off the street. They're not doing that. The only guys that are there are the 9 to 12 guys that are in the program. So it's going to be a very small, intimate time. And as things relax, um, we'll change from month to month. And maybe if it stays three people, we'll just rotate who's interested in going. So um, we'll go this time. A few of us are going to go. Me and Eli um, and maybe Brian will go. And we'll, we'll go this time. And uh, then we'll rotate it around. So the atrium ministry is still going strong. Brother Brian's message went out today. Uh, I, I got one in the queue for next week. Um, I got a bunch of guys that are coming forward. So guys, if you're out there and you got any preaching you and you like to bring something from the Word of God, 15 minutes and it's a great opportunity. So we've got about four or five guys doing it now. And the bigger that rotation gets, the less work it is for all those hands. So that's going out to the atrium facility right on 79 and all their sister facilities. So there's uh, countless, I don't know, not countless, but there's a lot of uh, elderly and infirmed individuals that are getting a service from us every week. And we're basically the only show in town. Everybody else cut and run. And, uh, you know, we stayed. And that's the thing. I don't, I don't get everybody cutting and running. You know, is everybody... I remember being years and years ago when I used to volunteer in a prison. I was on a volunteer basis. Uh, but we volunteered at the Arthur Kill Correctional Facility. Eli was there. We did that. It was pretty wild. But when they found out the facility was going to close, like all the Christian ministries just took off. We stayed till the very end. We were going there every single day. We were going there seven days a week uh, to these guys among the few of us. And I just don't get it. You know, churches are happy to keep their doors closed and churches are happy to not meet and church I don't I don't get it I get being sensible and I get being smart and I get being wise but I if you got the spirit of God in you you should want to meet and minister and, and do it as best you can and we've been chomping at the bit and we're just so thankful for this and I'm not trying to knock anybody I just I just don't get it just some things I don't get I hope I never get so um uh, so that's next week is the rescue mission. That was my little sermonette. Thank you, Mark, for smiling. Um, we got the men's meeting will come up uh, the third week, third Friday, right? So what's that, the 17th, right? The 17th, we'll do the men's meeting. And then, uh, Lord willing, end of the month again, Matt, Jenny, I think? Yes, okay. Uh, end of the month, fourth Friday of the month, we'll get the youth together again. I know Danielle is thinking about trying to get the ladies together again, but we are still very kitchenless. So we're just trying to figure out how to do that. Got the countertops in this week, but uh, it's that, that thrill wore off. Now it's like I, just, I want doors on the cabinets. But anyway, so that's, it's coming along, though. Thanks for being patient. I got one more big announcement. It's a big announcement. Now, ordinarily, and many of you from Staten Island know this, for the last 20 years or so, 20 years maybe, uh, we have volunteered our time and loved doing it at the kids stuff vacation bible school that the church in staten island has been hosting for a long time maybe 25 years um it's big it's a big production those of you have been there it's a big production it's a hundred plus kids it's skits and games and classes and levels and all this stuff so it was really a hard thing for them to pull off with any kind of like mitigation this summer so they have canceled that so because I had nothing to do that week, you know. We figured, you know, we haven't really done a lot for our kids. We've got the youth getting together and the ladies getting together and the men getting together and, you know, this outreach and stuff like that. But our kids, you know, like our kids, our, our, our precious ones, right? The kids are the precious ones, man. To me, those are my jewels right there, right? Those are my three pride and joys. Like, you touch them, I'm going to scratch your eyes out. Like, I'm not, I don't mess with them. Like, and don't mess with them. I don't mess with them. You don't mess with them. I, but uh, they're so important, right? And kids, sometimes in the ministry, kids get like kicked to the curb. You know, and it's strange because we devote maybe 85% of our resources towards the people where you might get 15% of the impact. But if you can get somebody at 9 or 10 or 11 or 12 grounded and saved and understanding that God is worthy to be praised, you know what? That's an impact that'll last the next maybe 60, 70, 80 years, and it'll be fruitful and multiply. So I think sometimes we've got to pour some more energy into our kids. You guys, and we're praying about starting the kids' classes up again. We're starting about, we're praying about that. Maybe next week, I'm not sure. I just, I'm waiting on how to go. I do say, if you got a little one or know a little one, Eli and Terry are still making their videos, and everybody who's got a little one or know a little one in here should be 
putting their little one in front of that video and having them memorize those verses and do things because they're awesome. They got object lessons. They got all kinds of stuff, but that's neither here nor there. So what we thought was we're not going to do a full-on camp. We don't have the capability to do that yet, but we want to do something and have a kid's outing that week of August 18th, August 19th, and August 20th. So what we've done is we've rented and reserved the Hilltop Pavilion at Home Del Park. That's the one that's up on the hill. That's a little more secluded, uh, a little more kind of left to themselves, and you can kind of shelter in a little bit better over there. And we're just thinking, we just want to do this word of mouth, our kids, families you might know. We'll cap it at maybe 25 or 30 kids. We don't want it to get crazy. We can have 75 under the pavilion. But we want to have three nice days out with the kids, maybe 9 to 1, do some games, do some Bible lessons, you know, have some fun, do some skits, have some snacks, and just make a really nice time for our children. I say that to say this. This is our church, right? It's not my church, and it's not anybody else's. It's our church. So to make that happen, we're going to need help. If nobody wants to help, we're either going to have to reduce what we could do or possibly not do it at all. So later on this afternoon, I'm going to text you because I wanted to do it paperless so nobody's got to like handle things. I will text you a digital form if you either want your children to be a part of it so we can start to order things and get numbers. And I'll send out another form if you'd like to be a helper and be some part of it. Again, those of you that have kid stuff experience, you might be twitching right now because that's like a monolithic production. It is, it is so many moving parts. We're going to be easy peasy. We're going to be like cool in the gang. We're just going to be like, you know, mad chill, yo. We're just going to get the kids together. Legit. I mean, we're just going to get the kids together and we're just going to like figure out some things that we could do, have a good time. Maybe on that third day, have a barbecue and have the parents come around. But just really give the kids a chance to maybe bring a friend or a cousin that they want to be involved. And we just want to do it word of mouth. I'm not putting up banners. I'm not putting stuff out there. And just have a really good time. So does that sound good? I think it'll be a really nice time. I know my kids are going. What's the name of it? Eli has, is, is, is uh, tentatively calling it Kids in the Garden. So uh, Kids in the Garden. So we've got to get rid of it. If there's any weeds, we've got to take care of them. But we'll try to get the kids out there in the garden. So... He's going to be out there with, like, you know, Roundup shooting kids. Don't do anything like that. That's bad stuff. All right, so a uh, few things to pray for, and then we'll pray. And again, I'll send those things out today. Please don't do it the usual way where August 3rd, you're like, oh, I should respond to that thing he sent me. Like, try to let me know as soon as possible, because what I would like to do for people that are willing to help, I like to meet with people that are willing to help next week after church, maybe have, like, lunch at my house or something, and just try to start to plan and think about, because... I am not the smartest guy in the room, and in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. So I'd like to hear the people that want to help, what are your ideas, what are your things, what can we do, what's a schedule we could reasonably conceive to give the kids a blessed time and a good time and do things sensibly within our, within our time frame. So be, uh, be looking for that. Some things to pray for. Pray for Bruno's dad, uh, Wolfram, still kind of dealing with, um, just still dealing with uh, the, the colon cancer. He's having surgery when? Tomorrow, so I'm glad I mentioned that. So Bruno's dad having surgery tomorrow. Uh, he's like 91, right, Terry? Yeah, he's up there. Uh, pray for Matt. Matt asked for prayer for his dad, Harry. Um, Josh uh, was th talking about his friend LJ. I had a good time to speak to him about the Lord this week, so keep his friend LJ in prayer. Um, Matt also asked for prayer for his aunt Kathleen, who's been diagnosed with uh, breast cancer. And um, that's it. You know, just uh, also... Just for our outreach, we really, the summer is upon us, as you can feel, and we're trying to get out there. We're trying to get out there Wednesday nights, try to get there on Saturdays, and we want to try to hit up a boardwalk this week or something. We've got to do something, because all of our fairs, most of them close September and October. If uh, the world doesn't end again, there's going to be a lot of fairs. I mean, there's a lot of fairs got pushed to September and October, so when the fall rolls around, we will be probably very busy. So, anything else i got to mention? All right. So uh, I'm going to have a word of prayer, and then we will, gentlemen, we'll go on. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for your mercies, Lord. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your kindness. Lord, we just lift up our time together. Thank you for every visitor that's here, Father. I pray you might make them feel comfortable, Lord, and that you open their eyes of understanding to the word of God. 
Let, uh, if any man speak, let him speak as of the oracles of God, Lord, that Jesus Christ be preeminent. Let his saving blood and his finished work just be lifted up high. May his word just strengthen your church. Lord, we pray for Bruno's dad specifically. We pray you'd have mercy on Wolfram, Lord, most of all in his soul. I pray you'd save his soul, give him that assurance of salvation, Lord, that he knows where he's going. And I pray you'd guide the hands of the doctors, Lord. I pray you would bring him through this, Lord. Give Bruno peace and comfort and wisdom as he ministers to his dad, Lord. Pray for Matt's dad, Harry, Lord. Pray for his aunt Kathleen, Lord, and the breast cancer there, Lord. I pray you'd reach in there, Lord, and take care of that. Most of all, that you might save her soul if she's not saved, Father. I pray for Josh's friend, LJ. Thank you, Lord, for the open doors to speak there, Lord. Those are not by accident or by our own will. Just by your grace and mercy, Lord, that you take a willing heart and you give us a chance to speak of your goodness to someone else, Lord. And I pray for LJ, Lord, that his soul be saved for sure and he'd have that assurance of salvation answer his questions, Lord, give him that confidence in you. And Lord, we pray for our outreach, Lord, as we try to bring the word of God to our neighbors and our communities, Lord, and even to the uttermost in the Philippines, Lord, with Brother Nini, and out there in Haiti, Lord, with Brother Maurice, Lord, I pray just we'd be found faithful, Lord. And if you came back today, Lord, or you came back tonight, you'd find us, Lord, working, you'd find us busy, you'd find us like Ruth, Lord, gleaning in the field. And Lord, I pray you'd get the glory out of your church today and strengthen your people. In Jesus' blessed name we ask it, Father. Amen. Amen. Good job. We definitely need two mics. I have it in C. Go for it. Is there another one? Mm -hmm. Are you sure? Is it the cable file? The the cable file? Okay. okay. You can remain seated. <laughs> Turn to page 204. Turn your eyes upon Jesus.
singing pastor if you would Those are always free. You're welcome to take anything on that table. Use it for yourself. Use it for somebody else. Um, uh, Mike McCracken, I know I keep forgetting to say hello to you. Where'd he go, Mike? Mike, there he is. He's not a visitor either anymore. He's racking up his frequent driver miles uh, coming down here. And Mike Colleen, you didn't think I was going to let you get away with your birthday being yesterday, right? So Mike had a birthday yesterday, 39 again. He looks great. And uh, he's a great brother. So we're going to sing for Mike today, right? We're going to sing happy birthday for him. So let's do it. Ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Mike. Happy birthday to you. The Christian version. Happy birthday to you. Only one will not do. Born again means salvation. How many have you? Amen. God bless you, brother. Amen. Amen. Great brother, Mike. Great brother. Great, good to have. Good to have everybody here. I hope you, I know he's saying happy birthday in church. If you, if you came for religion this morning, you came to the wrong auditorium. So just sit back and relax. Um, uh, everybody's sitting far enough so I can't spit on them so they're safe because we're going to just have a good time in the Word of God today. So if you have your Bible, are we recording it, babe? Yes? If you have your Bible, uh, turn to uh, Romans chapter 8 and John chapter 8. So find two places, multitasking, right brain, left brain, kind of get it going. All right, so Romans chapter 8 is where we'll be first, and then we'll flip over to John chapter 8. We've been working our way through the book of John. Uh, we've just been teaching through the book of John, going through the book of John, and... Um, some of what we're saying in John has to do with what we're saying in Romans, so we're going to kind of just be in those two spots here today. Um, <clears throat> now, thankfully, thankfully, maybe, maybe you didn't come down with coronavirus, but, I thought I'd get some more amens on that, but you know, <laughs> but uh, maybe you didn't come down with that, but your scale in your bathroom may have been infected with a growing menace. Many are calling quarantine 15. Teen, teen, teen. All the weight you gained during your COVID-19 lockdown extravaganza. And now, much like New Year's Day, scores of people are doomed to fail dieting to lose all their new baggage they acquired in the last few months. In fact, most diets don't make it past seven days because diet is D-I-E with a T at the end. And people just, people just don't have the willpower to do it. Now that's physical, right? But let's swing it over to spiritual right now. In the book of Hebrews chapter 12, the Lord is speaking to believers and he says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. The Lord says, hey guys, you want to run this Christian life? You've got to lay aside some of that excess weight and that sin that is dragging you down. And in the same way you don't physically have the strength to just discipline yourself into getting rid of the unwanted pounds, guess what? We don't have the power in ourselves to overcome. We don't have the power in ourselves to run that race in our own strength. And so in Romans chapter 8, let's read it, verses 1 to 4. There is therefore now no condemnation 
to them which are in Christ Jesus, and the verse doesn't stop there, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak, through the flesh. God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. You see, I don't have the strength in myself. Everything's dragging me down. Everything's holding me back. I want to go on for God, but it's like I can't do it. God says, no kidding. It's the law of sin and death. And when the law of sin and death keeps dragging you down, the Lord Jesus Christ makes you free indeed. He gives you the power to overcome. Now what am I talking about? The law of sin and death is the tendency for everything to break down when left to itself. Right? In the physical realm, everything falls apart, doesn't it? The car breaks down, the body gets brittle, I mean, the teeth fall out, the hair falls out, the roof get, needs fixing and you call Mike. I mean, all these things happen, right? Things break in the physical realm. Guess what? In your spiritual life, guess what? In your spiritual life, your walk with Jesus Christ will not naturally improve. It will fall apart when left to itself. That is the natural tendency unless the Spirit of God enables you and you yield to Him to get the victory. You want to lose the weight? You've got to yield to the Holy Spirit of God. Now look at John 8, 36. Just flip over there. Hold your place in Romans and go back to John 8 for a second. John 8. We've been reading through John 8. Look at this promise Jesus Christ gives us here in John 8. John 8, verse 36. Familiar verse. I probably didn't have to turn there, but I just wanted to go across your eyeballs. John 8, 36. Jesus Christ promises us something. He says, If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Amen. Hey, guys, that's one amen. Amen. I got any other amens on that one? Yeah. All right, that's good. That's two-thirds of you. All right, but you know what? Jesus Christ promised to make you free indeed. Not in theory, but in reality, in truth. He's not just spouting theological words. He's telling you things that can have practical application in your life if you test them and prove them and apply them, if you yield to them. Now we looked at Romans chapter 6. And Romans chapter 6, 6 is the number of man. And in Romans chapter 6, we saw that Jesus Christ made you free from sin, from that sin nature we inherited from Adam. He broke the power that that has over you, if you avail yourself to it. Then last time we were in here, we looked at Romans chapter 7. 7 is the number of completion, of things being finished. And we saw how Jesus Christ made you free from the law of Moses. You are free from all those do's and don'ts that God gave to Israel through Moses. That law is finished for you. It has no power to condemn you anymore. Amen? But now we come to Romans chapter 8. And the number 8 is the number of a new beginning. The number of a new beginning. And in Romans chapter 8, we read about how Jesus Christ made you free from the law of sin and death. Why? So you can overcome the downward spiral and have new life in Jesus Christ. Right? You got saved, I'm glad, but you got some life to live for Him now. You got some life to live now. And I'm talking to Christians mainly. If you're not a Christian, I'll get you in here somewhere. But Christians, I'll tell you this. If you want to walk in victory, and if you want to walk in victory, just give me one amen. amen. Right. If you want to walk in victory, guess what? You can't do it by your discipline. You can't do it by your effort. You cannot do it in your own strength. You need the Holy Spirit of God to overcome the law of sin and death so you can be free indeed. And I'm going to show you how that's possible today through the Lord Jesus Christ and His Spirit. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your mercy. Thank you, Lord, for your book. Thank you for this power that worketh in us, Lord. Thank you for the grace you've shown us. Lord, you're a great God, Lord. You didn't just save us and plop us on the road to nowhere, Lord. You saved us and put a heavenly hope in us, Lord, in a song and set us on a new course, Father. And you said you'd guide us on the way if you'd let us. 
uh, and if we let you, Father. So I pray, Lord, you speak to your people tonight, Lord. I pray you put some victory there, Lord. I pray you put some victory there, Lord. Let some chains fall down. Let some weights drop. And let us see, Lord, and yield to the Holy Spirit and let him have his way in our hearts, Lord, and do business with you today. I ask, starting with me, Lord, that I would not do this in my own strength, Lord, but just yield to you and submit to you that your life may be manifest in my flesh. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stay in your Bible and go to Romans chapter 7. Go back to Romans chapter 7. We were in Romans 8. Go back to Romans 7. We look at a lot of Bible verses. I hope you get ready to turn. Romans chapter 7. Romans 7. Can I say this? I'll say this first. I don't know why I say, can I say this? Someone's going, no, you can't say that. Right? All right. All right. So let me say this. You had no power to please God before you were saved, right? <laughs> you had no power to please God before you were saved. And guess what? You have no power to please God in your own strength after you were saved. Right? You've still got the same rotten flesh. You're a saved soul. You've got a quickened spirit. But this rotting corpse is still struggling and frustrating against you and God's purpose. So you had no power on your own to please God before you were saved. And you've got no power on your own to please God after you were saved. Look at Romans 7. You see it right there. Verse 15. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. <laughs> if then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Paul sounds like a crazy person. He's like, I want to do the right thing, and then some's making me do the wrong thing, and I don't want to do the wrong thing. And when I do the wrong thing, it's not really me doing the wrong thing. It's sin to me doing the wrong thing, but I really want to do the right thing. <gasps> right? You ever feel that way? Right? I've been there. I hope you've been there. This is a real book, and that was a real man who had real problems just like you. And this is maybe what we say, the greatest Christian who ever lived. He's lamenting his flesh's utter inability to please God. I can't do it with this thing. I can't do it on my own. The old Scottish preacher John Knox, he said, I sob and lament for that I cannot be rid of of sin. I desire to live a more perfect life. You desire that at all? If you desire to be higher than you are today, better than you are today, you're in good company. But I know there's still something dragging you down. This flesh is resisting you. This flesh is frustrating you. This flesh does not want to yield. And you can't give God glory through this flesh. You can't do it in your own strength. What do you see Paul lamenting and John Knox lamenting? And I'm sure you, if you give me another amen, that you have lamented at some time in your life. It's not the lament of a lost man. When you were lost, you drank iniquity like water. You didn't know it was wrong and you didn't think twice about it. Yeah, I'll say amen for you. Amen. Right? My kids go, but daddy, didn't you know that was wrong when you were unsafe, lost? I say, I didn't care. Nobody cared. You just drank iniquity like water. You jumped into the pig pen. You live and let live. And who thought about right and wrong? Who thought about sin? Who thought about God? I'm just having fun. But this is the lament of a saved person. Because a saved person is the one with the Holy Spirit of God inside them. That's like, mm, 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 kind of having this inward battle. Like, I, I, I see that in the Bible, but I don't see that in the mirror. And I'm just like, ah, struggling. That struggle is a sign that you are saved. This is not the lament of a lost man. It's the lament of a saved man stuck in his sinful flesh. That's the lament you see in Romans 7. Look at verse number 18. He says it right there. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. Paul's saying, hey, Romans 5, he talks about being saved. Romans 6, he's already talked about being saved. He's already, he's talking about now, in my flesh now, in this part of you that has not been saved yet. Your flesh has not been regenerated yet. In that part of you now, there's nothing good. There's nothing good. Shocker, there's nothing good. I know we primp it, and Cutting Edge Studio is a wonderful place to go to have that done. All right, we primp it and we dress it up, we doll it up and all that stuff. But guess what? This thing is waiting to get changed. This thing is corrupt. This thing is vile. This thing is always going to betray you. This thing never had the strength to please God, and it still doesn't have the strength to please God. Have you made the same realization that Paul makes in that verse? Got to make that realization. 
that you have no power to please God in the flesh. I know that bothers you. I can feel the air get tense. That rubs your pride the wrong way. To be told from the Bible, look at Romans 8, 8, right across the page. To be told from the Bible, look at, and I'll let God say it. I won't even say it. God, you're going to say this to them. I'm not going to say this. And God doesn't say, can I say something to you? No, God just says it. And he says in Romans 8, 8, he says, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. God said it. That settles it. Right? You know, if you had to be 10 feet tall to get to heaven, guess what? Now that you're saved, your flesh still fails to please God. You didn't get saved and whoop, turned 10 feet tall, and now look at me, my, my flesh, I please God. No, no, no. If you're in the flesh, you can never please God in the flesh. You cannot please Him in the flesh. Your flesh has not been changed yet. You know, because you've got, you got two natures now. If you go to Romans chapter 7 right there and look at verse 19, look at this. Look at Paul keeps saying. Look at this. Just, just look at what he's saying. and Look at the conflict. And say amen wherever it hits home. <laughs> For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law. That when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, that saved person inside of you. is like, yeah, I love God. Yeah, I want to serve God. Yeah, I want to go on for God. But I see another law in my members, in my hands, my feet, my heart, my lusts. I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Guys, as a believer, you are trapped in a sinful body that's subject to the law of sin and death. I know it sounds like bad news. I'll give you hope in a second. But that struggle is real. You're not the only one to have ever thought those thoughts. Right? So when the devil tells you, you're no good, you're not like all those goody two-shoes at church, there are no goody two-shoes at church. Everybody goes home, shuts the door, and wrestles just like Paul wrestles and says, I wanted to do good, I wanted to hand out that track, I really didn't want to be nasty to my wife today, and I'm just an idiot. It's like, ugh! Like you're fighting yourself. And that's what Paul's saying. It's like he's fighting himself. Can I tell you that without the Spirit of God, your eyes will always want to wander to where you know you shouldn't look. Apart from the Spirit of God, they're always going to wander. Can I tell you that your hands will naturally reach for those things God told you not to touch? That's their tendency. That's their inclination. That's the law in your members. They're going to reach for those things. Your mouth can't help but misspeak say something hurtful, gossip, curse, spew forth bitterness. That's the inclination, brethren, of this stinking flesh. I didn't expect a lot of amens there either. And your mind, your heart, will conceive ideas and impulses on their own that the Holy Spirit inside of you cannot stand. And you'll be like a crazy person going, what am I thinking? What am I doing? What is happening? Amen. It'll happen if it hasn't happened already. But look at verse 23. You say, oh, come on, Pat, you're exaggerating. You're trying to scare me. Look at 23. Look at what the Bible says. Look what God calls it. I see another law in my members. Look at the end of the verse. The law of sin, which is in my members. This thing we're talking about is not a fluke. It's not an exception. It's a law. It's a rule. It's a principle. It's a guarantee. Brother, you will not be the exception. You will not be the exception. You don't have some divine spark apart from the Holy Spirit of God living inside of you as you yield to Him. That's your strength. That's your hope. If you lean on your own, own abilities, you're going to fall. You try to discipline yourself like a diet, you're going to snap. You move that rubber band, you try to stretch it, it's just going to break. And if it doesn't, it's going to go back to the way it was before. You need the Holy Spirit of God to do something supernatural. You need the Holy Spirit of God to do something beyond your capabilities. Hey, I've learned since moving to New Jersey all too painfully well that you leave your garden alone and the law of sin and death will choke it out with weeds in no time. 
Just leave it alone. Amen, Brother Matt, right? Amen, right? You leave it there. I got stuff growing. I don't know where the heck this stuff came from. I got shrooms growing up in my front lawn. Don't come over and use them, all right? But I, mean, I, got, I got stuff there. I'm like, what the? You know, my, my kids are like, Daddy, you're a little obsessed about the lawn. I guess, I guess I am a Jerseyan now. I guess I am. I'm fully converted, I guess. But you know what? Just leave it alone. Log, look at what happens, all right? And then run away from your neighbors, right? You stop tending to your spiritual life, and the law of sin and death will kill your walk with Jesus Christ in no time. You stop tending to it. You stop paying attention to it. You stop yielding to the Spirit of God and just let some things grow. Let them grow. Let them take root. And guess what? They will choke out anything good that God has put in your life. It's a law. It's a principle. You can bank on it. So look at Paul's exclamation in verse 24. Look what he says. You might be saying this. Oh, wretched man that I am. That's present tense. That's him after the cross. That's him as a saved individual. Oh, wretched man that I, present tense, washed in the blood, am right now in this flesh. That I am. Who shall deliver me from the body, from the body, from the body of this death, this thing that's subject to the law of sin and death, that's fighting me all the way to heaven. Paul's exclamation has got to be our realization if you want your walk with Jesus Christ to thrive. You've got to make that realization right now if you want your walk to be strong so you're not sucker punched by the flesh when you're not looking. Verse 25. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord so then with the mind... I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. You know what Paul had to do? Paul says he just turned his eyes to God. Who's going to do it? Not me. God. I thank God. Paul had to come to the end of himself to deliver his walk after being saved. After being saved. This is not salvation. This is a victorious Christian life he's trying for. Does anybody want that? I want a victorious, I want to be a good husband. I want to be a good dad. I want to be a good friend. I want to be a good witness. I want to be the best that God would have me to be. But I can't do it on my own. Go to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. I know, I get excited about this book. It's just so plain right there. I just, I hope I never get old and stodgy. I used to, I used to tell my wife, if I ever sound like a, teacher or like those college professors, right, Alan, who just talk out of their, you know what, and just like the words don't mean anything to them. You know, I don't want to ever sound like that. If I start sounding like that, I start, start, I start pontificating about the deeper things of God. If I just start, just shoot me like an old horse and make glue out of me, it might be good for something. Or at least something will stick. Uh, Colossians 2 verse 6, here it is right here. I just get excited about the Bible and I get excited about Jesus Christ and excited about this. I make no apologies, but Colossians 2 6, as is a simile, right? As means in the same way. As ye have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Had you received Christ Jesus by faith? How do you have to walk? By faith. What happened when you got saved? You got saved by faith, and you must walk by faith. 2 Corinthians tells us, for we walk by faith. We don't walk in our own strength. We don't walk in our own know-how. We can't figure out this Christian life and maneuver it and manipulate it. We've got to fall like Paul at the feet of our Savior and say, God, help me to overcome. Lord, help me to yield to your spirit. Help me to lay myself on the altar that I might live unto you. Or your life might be manifest in my flesh. That's the key to victory. You've got to die, and he's got to live. You've got to be laid on the altar and he's got to be alive. That's why it's called a living sacrifice. And man, just think about the parallels. If you had to come to the end of yourself in order to be saved, and if you never came to the end of yourself, I would wonder if you are saved. If you just think I changed religions, or I put on a different checkbox on my college application, now I mark Christian or other, and not you know, a religious organization, that's not salvation. Salvation isn't reading the Bible. Salvation isn't going to a Bible-teaching church. Salvation is not even praying prayers. Salvation is coming to the end of yourself and realizing you are a lost sinner and Jesus Christ is your only sin-bearer. And unless you take the payment that he made for your sin, you're going to split hell like a bullet. 
That's where salvation really happens. And if you didn't come to the end of yourself, today would be a good day to come to the end of yourself and turn your eyes, like we sang, upon Jesus. Look unto him and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. But if you had to come to, and if you're saved, just say amen for me. All right, great acoustics. If you had to come to the end of yourself in order to be saved, guys, why would you lean on your own strength in order to please God after you were saved? Doesn't that sound like the dumbest thing in the world? Oh, God, I can't do it on my own. Save me. And then you pick up the baggage, and you're like, oh, it's just so hard, this Christian life. I can't do it. No kidding, you couldn't do it on your own. That's why you needed God to begin with. You need God to save your soul, and now that you are saved, you need God to save your life. You need God to redeem your life from destruction. And when you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you know what you got? I know all the things you got, but you know what you got? You got the power to live a life that is pleasing to God. You can now. The devil says you can't. The law of sin and death says you can't. But you know what the Spirit of God says? Yes, you can. If you avail yourself, you can. I know we've all got stories. I know we've all got scars. And sometimes it takes longer than others to get over things. I get that. It's not a microwave Christianity. You can't just put the hot pocket in the thing and go, boop, 60 seconds, 90 seconds, something, you know. No, it's 37 seconds. Whatever seconds it is, right, whatever it is, you can't do that with your Christian life. It takes two ugly words that Christians almost count them as curses. Time and work. And you just yielding to the Spirit of God, yielding to the Spirit of God, learning what He's about, getting close to Him, and you know what? You start to walk in victory. And when you got saved, guess what? You got the power to do that. Look at Romans chapter 8 again. Romans chapter 8 again. Isn't that exciting that you don't have to be the same old person you used to be? You don't have to be. You, don't, you can stay that way. It's a free country and you have a free will, but you don't have to be. And if you tell yourself you have to be, you're just kidding yourself. You're telling yourself that. Romans chapter 8 verse 2, what the Bible says. The Bible says, For the law of the Spirit of life, in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. What freed you? Only the Holy Spirit of God. Only the Holy Spirit of God can make you free from the downward trend of sin and death. That's it, baby. That's it. It's not church. It's not me. It's not you. It's not fellowship. God works through all those things. But brother, you hang your soul on the Holy Spirit of God. If the Holy Spirit of God doesn't help you walk, you're going to fall on your face. And you say, that's soul time preaching. I need it more relevant. That's as relevant as it gets. The Holy Spirit is the administrator of the church. The Holy Spirit is who makes this whole thing happen. And you and I got to get back to leaning on the Holy Spirit of God because if he leaves and he departs, this thing is the biggest waste of time I've ever seen in my life. I'd rather jump in a pool somewhere. Right? Why would we get together if not to learn more and yield more to the Holy Spirit of God? Listen, the law of gravity, right? It's holding you down right now. And the law of gravity says, what goes up must come down, right? It's a law. It's a constant. You can't escape it, right? Just keep jumping all you want. Doing some plyo right now. Just keep jumping all you want. Feeling good, man. And you just keep jumping all you want. Guess what? Every time I jump, you're going to fall down, right? The only way you overcome the law of gravity is by a greater law. That's how planes get off the ground. When you used to fly in them, when planes get off the ground, how does that multi-ton hunk of metal defy the law of gravity? Why? Because they're operating by a greater law than gravity. Gravity wants to pull you down, but the laws of lift and weight and thrust and drag, you know what they do? They let you soar to new heights. And brothers and sisters, the law of sin and death wants to weigh you down, wants to drag you down. But you know what? The law of the spirit of life makes you free to get up to that higher ground. That's what he'll do for you. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Just to, a couple of books over to the right. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Am I making sense so far? Amen. I'm trying to help you today. I'm trying to encourage you. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, look at verse 5. Look at what the Bible says here. For we preach not ourselves. Amen. But Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake, 
For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. That's your body, by the way. That thing you treasure so much is just a clay pot. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. You see how God did this thing? God put his power inside a weak, frail clay pot. Why? So he'd get all the glory. And people would know, whoo, God is in you of a truth, man. That's why he did it that way. Listen, if you had the power in your flesh to please God, why did Jesus Christ have to die? Look at chapter 12, same book, chapter 12. Chapter 12, verse 9. Paul was wrestling. Paul was struggling. Paul was trying to get this thorn taken away from him. And in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, he gets his answer from God. He gets a pretty emphatic no. And sometimes the answer from God is no. And in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, he, meaning God, said unto me, meaning Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength, is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power, the power, the power of Christ may rest upon me. You know what he's saying there? The Lord wants his power to be manifest in you. So that means the weaker you are, the stronger he can be. The you say, I can't do it. God says, perfect. I've been waiting for you to say that. Lord, I can't get the victory. It's about time. Watch me work now. Right? The weaker you are, the weaker you reckon yourself to be, the more you just give God room to show off his handiwork. If you were crippled, but you made it to the top of Mount Everest, who gets the glory? The one who carried you. How'd you get up here? How'd you get this victory? I'll tell you, that one that carried me. And in this weak, frail flesh, when people see habits drop out of your life, when people see your language change, when people see kindness take over with his own bitterness and wrath, when people see you saying no, when you just, just say yes, you know what they're going to say? How did this happen to you? How did you get on the mountaintop? There's one that carried me. His name is Jesus Christ. He gets the glory. Go to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter number 1. Look at verse 15. We don't avail ourselves to that power. We don't yield to that power. I'll speak for myself. I don't. Amen. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15. Paul writes, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And here it is, number three, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe, according to the working of his mighty power. That's Paul's prayer for the Ephesians, but it's not just Paul's prayer, it's the Holy Spirit's desire for you, brother, and you, sister, to know his power in your life. He doesn't want you walking around defeated all the time. He's given you the power so that you can rise above the dreck and rise above the ick and rise above the flesh. You can. I know we're going to struggle. Nobody's going to snap their fingers and become sinlessly perfect until God redeems our body and takes us home to heaven. But in the meantime, you can gain back some ground. You can take back some hands. You could take back some eyes. You could take back some inches. You could do it through Jesus Christ. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. Look at this. And you, those are the saved people, hath he quickened, that means made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked, past tense, according to the course of this world, according to the prince, watch it now, of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. You know what Paul says? Paul says, you know what it's like to be led by a power. You know what it's like to be led by Satan's power. I didn't get saved when I was 5 or 10. I got saved when I was 20. I lived like a dog for 20 years. 
I lived like a dog for 20 years, some of you more, some of you less. And you think about, and I think about how far I went. And you think about how far you went to satisfy your flesh when you walked according to that power. It said you wanted it and you went. It said go here and you jumped. It said let's do it and you did it twice as much because you know what? You were just led about by a power. You were led about how you can lead a dog with a treat. You could just lead him anywhere you want him to go. And Satan just went and just led your flesh around like an animal, like a dog just craving after its own lust and just leads you around. And Paul says, you remember what it was like to yield to that power? You know what it's like to be under the power of somebody, under the influence of somebody. You know what that led you to? Shame. That's all left was shame. Scars, broken hearts, broken families, broken dreams, broken lives. That's all it led to. A moment of thrill and then worshiping the porcelain God right after that. Right? That's, that's what it led to. That's what it leads to. Look at Ephesians chapter 3. You know, it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way. We will stumble, we will fall, we will still skin our knees, but we can keep on an upward trajectory, brethren, by the power of the Spirit of God in our lives if we yield to it. Look at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Now unto him, speaking of God now, you see verse 19, Ephesians 3, 20, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. You think about how far you went to satisfy your flesh when you're under that power of the prince of the power of the air. Can you think about what amazing things might happen if you learn to lean on God's power inside you? What a day that will be. What a testimony you will be. What an impact you will have. That will not bring shame. That will bring glory. Can you imagine your life bringing glory to Jesus Christ throughout all ages, world without end? Amen? You just yield to the Spirit of God, and God gets the glory. It doesn't bring shame. It brings glory, and that glory doesn't stop when you die. That glory says is going on into eternity. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. So you know what I want you to do, guys? I want you to do a little visualization. I want you to think big. Think big. Because as big as you can think, God can do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. So think big. Who would you like to be for the Lord Jesus Christ? Huh? What weight would you like to lose for him? I don't mean the scale, I mean in your walk. What would you like to lose and what would you like to gain? What would you like to grow in? We'll let you grow in compassion, grow in boldness, grow in mercy, grow in long-suffering, grow in love, grow in kindness. Where would you like to grow? Just think about it, would you? Who would you like the Lord Jesus Christ to make you by his glory? God can do better than that. The best you can think, God can do exceeding abundant above all that we ask or think. Just think about it. You know what happens as you're thinking about it? You got your visualization? You got it? You got it? Just nod up and down. You, got it? you know what you want? What's that thing that you'd like to get victory over? And what's that thing that you'd like to see more of in your life? You got it? You know what the law of sin and death says? Right now it cripes up on your shoulder and says, You're done. You're never going to make it. You're stuck. You can't change. That's who you are. That's how you are. You're never going to be different. You tried that once. You're going to flop again. Don't even try. That's the law of sin and death just coming up there going, mm-mm-mm. You know what the law of the spirit of life says? You're free. That's what he says. The law of the spirit of life says, you're free. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Amen? You choose which law you want to follow. Go to Ephesians chapter 6, look at verse 10. I'm not giving you pie in the sky. I know it takes work and effort and time, but it's there. The power is there. You get a big power tool, you want to rip a room out, you don't just click your heels and it's gone. It takes some work, but there's the power. The power is in your hands. Ephesians 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord 
and in the power of his might. Can I tell you, before you charge hell with a squirt gun, make sure you humble yourself to his might. Make sure you know, I can't do this, God. Help me with this. Help me with that. Help me with this. Call upon him as long as you live. You take that thing, that thing pops up, that lust pops up, that thing pops up, get to God, call another brother or sister in Christ, get in the book, quote some verses, bring it to God, say, Lord, wash this in your blood. I can't beat this. I can't do this. Lord Jesus, you've got to take it. Because if you don't take it, I can't fight it. See what happens. I double dare you. You don't do that because some of you like it. You like your pet sin too much. You don't want to let it go and see if God would take it. But if you want to see it, give it a shot. It might shock you. Look at Philippians chapter 1. Next book over. Philippians 1. Philippians 1. Look at verse 6. Am I making any sense at all? All right. Philippians 1 verse 6. Look at this. Ready? Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Can I tell you the God that saved you is working in you to overcome the destruction of sin and death? He's work he started when you got saved, and he'll keep it going until you get home to glory. Listen, if your house, your physical house, your home, has a generator, you could be confident when all the power around you fails. Right, Eli? All the power around you fails. You got that generator, and you've still got power. You're fine. Guess what? If your house has the Holy Spirit, you could be confident you could overcome the law of sin and death. Amen. You've got the power inside you. You've got the Lord inside of you. Look at Philippians 2, verse 12. Look at it there. He says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I don't care where you were this week or last week. He's still right there where he's been the whole time since you've been saved. Just yield to him. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and troubling. Watch this. For it is God which worketh in you both to will, he'll give you the desires, and to do, he'll give you the actions of his good pleasure. You don't have to work anything up. You don't have to manufacture something. Just work out what God has worked in. That's it. Yield to the Holy Spirit. Yield to what he wants to do in your life. Yield to what he's telling you. Go to 1 Thessalonians, a few books to the right. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Look at verse 23. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23. What I'm saying may look impossible. It is in your own flesh. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. Look at this impossible task. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. You're not sure you have three parts? Watch it right now. And I pray God your whole spirit, that's one, and soul, that's two, and body, that's three, be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That sounds impossible. How can I do that, God? How can I do that? Verse 24. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. He'll do it through you. It seems impossible, but the Lord will do it through you if you let him. If you let him, he'll do it through you. A.W. Tozer said this. He said, God is looking for those with whom he can do the impossible. Any lost cases here? God says, I'm, one, I'm, I'm ready to work. Amen. Me too. God says, this is what a guy said, God is looking for those with whom he can do the impossible. What a pity that we plan only the things that we can do by ourselves. Stop leaning on your own strength. George Mueller, one of my favorite saints, said this, favorite brothers of old, said, Faith does not operate in the realm of the possible. There is no glory for God in that which is humanly possible. Faith begins where man's power ends. Say, God, I've been like this my whole life. How do I change? I don't know. He does. That's why it's called faith. Forsaking all, I trust him. Lean on him. Grow in him. Yield to him. What did Jesus say in Mark 10? With men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God, all things are possible. 
He took a guy like Saul, who was killing Christians, made him the master builder of the New Testament church. You think he can't help you? Finally, here's, go back to Romans 8. We'll end right here, Romans 8. My last point, my last question, it's not a long one. Having said all this, here's the question you might be thinking. Okay, how do we live according to this law of the spirit of life so we can walk in victory. I mean, how do we apply this law? What do we do, right? I'm a doer, right? What do I do? I see this kind of thing you're saying, but what do I do to get there? I'm glad you thought that question. Romans 8, verse 5. I'll give you two things that this passage says. Romans 8, 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. What do we have to do first? Well, first, as believers, you know what we got to do? We need to mind what's right. we got to mind what's right. The battle begins in your mind. You gotta fix your mind. You gotta get rid of your stinking thinking and put them some, put in some Holy Spirit words, right? Romans twelve two says, "Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind." You got all this old stuff in there. You gotta get some new stuff in there. You gotta get a new way of thinking in there, a new philosophy, a new direction, a new spirit in there. You get that through this book. You've got to fix your mind. You've got to mind what's right. You know what happens when you don't? Philippians 3.19 tells us of those whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, who mind earthly things. If all you're doing, if your mind is full of carnal things, earthly things, fleshy things, guess what happens? You will be carnal. You will be earthly and you will succumb to the law of sin and death, and your end will be destruction. It's not too hard, right? That's not a, a leap of anything. If you're only thinking about and filling yourself up with sex, drugs, and whatever else it is, guess what? That's going to be your modus operandi. That's going to be what you gravitate towards. You know, if you mind spiritual things, guess what? You'll start to become more spiritual. You know, many years ago, I used to dive competitively, right? That's where you bounce on a diving board and you go in a pool, right? And you do these weird things. You know what they used to tell me when I dove? My coach would tell me in the beginning. He said this. He said, everything follows your head. You know, you're going to do a one and a half in a tuck. You've got to throw your head down. You're going to do like a reverse. You've got to throw your head back. You're going to do a twist. You've got to start with your head. Everything follows your head. You got that? You see the application? Everything follows your head. So where's your head this morning? Where's your mind this morning? Because everything else, hands, feet, heart, lusts, every, it's going to follow your head. If you're just filled up on the wrong stuff, guess what? It's going to just follow suit. But if you start filling up on something good, you might start going in a different direction. You know, it's no coincidence they say that your brain is like a sponge or a spongy substance. Got questions, see Alan Wood. But you know, they say your brain is like a spongy substance. I think that's a good metaphor because that means it might absorb whatever it contacts. And if God's words are spiritual things, then how much of this book do you mind? How much have you absorbed? You feel weak. Oh, I can't get the victory. Read your Bible this week. Don't come crying to me if you didn't read your Bible. I, I can't put the power in you. The power's here. You've got to start by changing your mind. You change your mind. You change your life. You get the right mind. If you let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, you know you'll start to become more like Christ Jesus. Right? Hey, if the plant is only as good as its soil, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Don't just read a verse every month. Don't just flick on your thing on the phone and get your notification. Say, I'm good, okay, 945, okay, there it is, boom, I'll put it away. Don't just do that. You're going to have to, and especially if you're fighting something worse, if you've got some deep-rooted things you're fighting, guess what? You need some more that's proportionate to the amount you're fighting. You're going to have to dump some more in. 
Some of us got some real baggage. Some of us got some real skeletons. Some of us got some real scars. Guess what? You know why I read as much of this as I can? You know why I'm trying to read it? This is my sixth time this year I'm trying to get through this book. I'm not trying to boast because I'm scum. Because I'm messed up. And if I don't get a more of this book in me, guess what? I'm going to be reprobate. I try to read it three times a year, four times a year, five times a year. I read it in two months during COVID, praise the Lord. I just, I, I just want to get as much of it as I can. Because the more I get, the more I get out of it. I don't even know what's happening, but it's like more pure water going through me. I know how. Lord, help me, Jesus. I know what I am. I know what I am. You're crazy for sitting here listening to me. If you knew who I am, you'd run screaming for the door. But I know who I am. I know what I am without Jesus Christ. I'm hell on wheels. And that's why I need God to put the brakes. I need God to captivate my mind. That's what I need. Look at Romans chapter 8 again, verse 12. Here's, that's number one. Got to mind the right things. And here's number two. And finally, number two. This is it. Romans 12, Romans 8, 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. Watch it now. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. We need to mind what's right, that's one. And number two, we need to mortify what's wrong. Mortify means to subdue it, to humble it, to put it to death. Hey, once we know what's right from God's word, you know what we got to do? Then we must yield to God's spirit to stop what's wrong. There were things I didn't know about 10 years ago that were wrong. Then I learned and I grow in grace. Now I know I probably shouldn't do that. Now that I know, now I got to yield and put those things to death in my life. I mind what's right and then I mortify what's wrong. Those two pistons will get your motor going in the right direction. Go to Galatians chapter 5. A couple of books to the right. The three books to the right. Galatians 5. Verse 24. Galatians 5 verse 24. Galatians 5.24. Look at this verse here, often misaligned. Galatians 5.24, the Bible says, And they that are Christ, do you belong to Jesus Christ? Yeah. Amen? Anybody? How about this side of the room? This side of the room is quiet. You belong to Jesus Christ? Yeah. Amen. All right, we'll do a little rally time. Go back and forth, see who yells the most. Get it ready for kids' day. All right, so if you belong to Jesus Christ, guess what it says right there? And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Now I'm going to give you a little English lesson. And I'll have a test at the end. You're in school, let me give you a little English lesson. Let me tell you about the tense of that verb in the English. Forget the Greek, forget the Hebrew. I'm just going to deal with the English. Have crucified is what we call in the English the present perfect tense. We use the present perfect tense. Nobody else knows? Nobody else knows? When you talk about something that began in the past and continues to the present. We have met in the Lloyd Road School for almost two years. It began May of 2018. We're still here today. You know what God says? You have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. Ever since you were saved, your flesh has been dead. Present perfect. It began the day you called out to God and he crucified you in Jesus Christ and it's still dead today sitting here looking at me right now. You have. That verse right there is a doctrinal statement concerning your position in Jesus Christ. You're dead to God. Your flesh is dead to God, so to speak. But see, that knowledge, that doctrine, it has to become power. It has to become practical. It has to do something in your life. That doctrine has to affect your deeds. Now look at Galatians 2.20. Let me show you the Apostle Paul taking that doctrinal statement and making it personal. Romans, uh, Galatians 2.20. Ready? Now he says, I am crucified with Christ. That's the present tense. That's where you are right now. So what Paul did is, I know that my flesh is dead, and he appropriated. He said, you know what? I am crucified. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Right. You see what you need to do, brother? You need to make your position in Jesus Christ personal, practical. Say, that's what God did for me? I'm dead. I am dead. I am dead. 
You know why that helps you? So when the law of sin and death leads your eyes to wander, you can stop and say, no, I'm not going to look. I'm dead. So when your hands reach for sin, you can yield to the Spirit of God that's beckoning to you that says, stop, son, you're dead. You're dead, remember? Just stay dead. Just let that thing stay dead. Don't dig that dead body up. Just leave it dead and let it be. Just walk on. So when your mouth is ready to fire off filth that you know is wrong, you have the power because your flesh is dead. And you reckon it. You count it to yourself. You say, that's my position. I'm going to make that practical. Hey, man, you want to come out? Bah, 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 bah. No, I'm dead. Click, delete. Hey, man, let's do this. No, nope, I'm dead. No, nope, no, nope, I'm dead. I'm dead. Didn't we have fun last week? We had fun last week. Good, clean fun. With the ambulance and everything rolling in behind you guys, I don't know what's going on. But you know what? We had fun. Nothing more fun than good, clean fun with Jesus Christ and the saints. We can laugh, we can play, but you know what? That stuff that only destroys, I have the power to say, I'm dead. I have been crucified. I am crucified. Make it personal. Last for uh, Colossians 3. Colossians 3. Just give me two more stops. We're just about done. Colossians 3. Look at this great passage. Colossians 3, verses 1 to 11. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? Your doctrine has to affect your deeds or else it's worthless. And if he has crucified you, then you just got to appropriate it. I am crucified. And that's how you walk, by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Because he's got something for you to do or else you wouldn't be here. If he was done with you, he'd just take you home. But he's not done. You're here, he's not done. So don't give up. Don't give up. Look at Colossians 3. If he, verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify, therefore, because of that, your members which are upon the earth. There's five of them. Look at it. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. He says, put those things to death. Put those things to rest if that's who you are. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked sometime, meaning the past, when ye lived in them. But now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, Malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth, lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Guys, you don't have to live like a lost person any longer. You don't have to. He says, you've already put that off in Jesus Christ. You already put this on. Lay hold on eternal life. Lay hold on what you've got and who you are. He's saying, be who you are in Jesus Christ. Stop going back to that dead thing that's six feet under and walk in the newness of life that God has given you. You don't have to live that way any longer. You have Jesus Christ living inside you now. You can. Whatever the devil whispers in your ear or the law of sin and death bothers you on the way out, you can die to self. So the Savior can live his life through you. You see? You don't have to drum anything up. He's already there. Just yield. Submit. Give in to what he wants. And he'll live his life through you. You know that best-selling book? Your Best Life Now? You heard that book? Great Christian selling book, you know. You know what you can have? Not your best life now, because your, your best ain't good enough. You know what you can have? You can have his best life now. His life manifest in your flesh. His life living through you. Listen, I'm just about done, but listen to this. If you're saved, you have the best parent, the best spouse, 
the best friend, the best worker, the best witness. You have the best anything you want to be living inside you right now. Jesus Christ is the best. Jesus Christ is the greatest. You want to be a good husband? You want to be a good wife? Jesus Christ knows everything about it. You want to be the best you can be at your job? Guess what? Jesus Christ worked as a carpenter for 30 years. He knows how to be the best worker that you could be. You want to be the best citizen? Jesus Christ knows how to be the best citizen. You want to be the best friend to somebody in need? Guess what? Jesus Christ is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. You want to be a great, uh, a great servant? Guess what? God looked at Jesus Christ and said, Behold my servant. He's inside you. He lives within you. He just wants to live his life through you. When the law of sin and death makes you slide naturally and tempts you to just slide into that natural mess, you have the Savior's Spirit to rise up supernaturally. Yield to Him and get out of His way. Romans chapter 8, and then we're done. We're just going to close right here. Let's finish where we started. Romans 8, thank you for your kind attention. Romans 8, <clears throat> you can, you can. It's just, will you? Will you yield? Romans 8, 2. Let's read it again. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free, amen, from the law of sin and death. And at a time when America thinks about freedom, you know what? We can rejoice because we are free indeed. We are. Romans 6, it seems like he told us, you got freedom from the power of sin. Romans 7, it looks like he says, hey, I freed you from the penalty of sin. In Romans 8, it looks like he helps freeing you from the presence of sin. He'll start it now, and one day, he's going to finish it. Verse 21 is where he's going to finish it. Because the creature, that's the new man living inside you, itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. One day, you're going to drop this flesh and never have to struggle with sin ever again. But until that day, you can get the victory. You can get some inches back. You can go forward. You can get closer to the mountaintop. You can. You can. Some of you don't believe me, but you can. You can. But we got to remember that we cannot live a victorious Christian life in our own strength. We need Jesus Christ. We need His Spirit. It's not a diet. It's not more disciplining yourself. It's not even your willpower. It's yielding to His power in your life. 14 and 15. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. You see what he's saying there? He's saying we can live by this new law, because we're not in bondage to that old law anymore. And then in verse 15 he says, because you haven't received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. You know what he's saying after this long treatise of how you can live anew? You know what he's saying? Don't be afraid, brethren. Don't be afraid. If you want to walk at liberty, you know what you do? Abba, Father. You cry out to your Heavenly Father. You reach out to Him, and you know what? You let Him take you, and you let Him show you what He wants you to yield to. And then you know what? You'll get the victory. Amen. Let's bow our heads. <clears throat> First, I want to ask you a question, heads about, eyes closed. Are you saved? Are you trusting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? If you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you could do that right now where you sit. If you recognize the fact that you've broken God's law, you've lied, you've lusted, you've taken His name in vain, you've lived in spite of Him for years, you know what? You are a lawbreaker, and the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ the Lord. He can give you that gift freely, by trusting his finished work on the cross. If there's somebody here like that today, you say, I've never been saved, but I'd like to be saved. Pat, here's my hand. Pray for me that I would understand this better. Here's my hand. Just put your hand up, slip it right back down, and we'll just pray that you understand the gospel and somebody will just take a Bible if you want and show you how you can know you have eternal life. Anybody like that at all today? Christian, I was speaking to you that know you're saved. Right? What is the weight that you want to lose? 
What is the growth you want to gain? Where do you want to be as a believer? Where do you know the Holy Spirit wants to take you? Don't be afraid. Cry, Abba, Father. He's a loving Father. He's like Daddy. That's what Abba means, like Daddy, Papa. You could come to him that intimately, that tenderly, and say, Lord, I'm scared. I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I can get this victory. The Lord says, it's okay, son. You can't get the victory, but I can do it through you. Here's what I want you to do. Yield, yield, yield. But if you won't yield when you go out into traffic, if you won't yield where it says yield, you will crash, and you will burn and you will have a problem. So brother and sister, you are accountable for what you heard today. You heard what God said is the means to victory. If you walk out and say, ah, yeah, well, blah, 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 you know what, and you refuse to yield into the traffic of this world, guess what? There may be some splat all over the highway of your life. God doesn't want that. I don't want that. You shouldn't want that. So if there's a Christian sitting here and says, you know what, Pat, pray for me. I got some things I need to yield just by an uplifted hand, you can say, Pat, pray for me. Lord, I heard that. I got some things I need to yield to the Holy Spirit for. Help me, Lord. I need his help. I can't help you, but he can help you. He can help you. Amen. I see your hands. Amen. Amen. I can't do it, but he could do it. And I'm going to pray to him out loud. You pray where you're sitting. And let's ask him to help you yield and just give in and submit to his best for you. Father, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your kindness. We thank you for your love. And Lord, only you could accomplish any eternal good from this. And I pray that's what you do for your glory's sake. Lord, don't let us walk out and refuse to yield. Spare us from that crash, Lord. Have mercy upon us. Give us the grace to trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. God bless you, everybody. Um, we'll see you next week, Lord willing. We'll be in touch about the stuff this week. If you want to stay extra long, you can take the party outside and... Hang out as long as you want. All right.